Okay, good evening ladies and gentlemen and a very warm welcome to Dorset Humanists, especially if this is your first time. I don't know if it is anyone's first time, but a very warm welcome uh, this evening. Um, in the unlikely event of an emergency, the main way out of here is the door at the back of the hall. Uh, if there's any problem there, there is a very uh, interesting stairway up to the uh, car park here as well if we need that. Toilets are in the corridor if you need the toilet any time. Uh, the meeting will end, well it normally ends at 9.15, it rather depends uh, how, we, how we go because uh, we've got a lot to pack in tonight. Two speakers, I'm sure there'll be lots of discussion, so I might decide to uh, extend it to half past nine, um, so that's just a warning, uh, but if you need to go at 9.15 then of course uh, feel free to do so. Well, one of our speakers this evening uh, is well known to Dorset Humanists. He's given us uh, some fantastic talks, one on the contradictory nativity stories about Jesus, and if you're interested in that topic, he's got his book here on that uh, subject. Another on arguments for and against the existence of God, and yet another one on free will. And again, uh, he's written a book on free will, and you can come and have a look at that book if you are interested. And uh, I think it's probably true to say that, uh, is it true to say you still don't believe in free will? Is that, uh, we don't want to get into that subject now, but anyway. Okay, right, we'll, uh, we'll leave that one. Um, he's a blogger, he is a tippling philosopher, whatever that is. Um, he's written several books about religious and philosophical matters. He's also been on the telly, you may have seen him on the big questions on Sunday morning. In January, he blogged about Islam, and that's why we're here tonight. Our other speaker is me. Um, and some years ago, I gave a talk to Dorset Humanists on the origins of the Quran. But I expect you're all too young to remember that particular occasion. It was uh, many years ago. I'm also chair of Dorset Humanists, in case you don't know, and neither Jonathan nor I are Muslims, as far as I know. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that we are both students of religion and have a great interest in religious matters. So I think you're going to have an informative evening and we'll leave here with a greater understanding of Islam, and that's our main aim this evening. So would you please give a warm welcome to both of our speakers. <laughs> so Jonathan Pierce uh, is going to go first, uh, so I will, without further ado, I will hand over to Jonathan and I'm timing him about half now. Jonathan. Thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? Okay, so I'm a liberal philosopher and as David said, I wrote a piece on Islam and I uh, was quite interested at the reactions I got to that, which were quite varied. And there was a number of fellow liberals who criticised me for what I said. I thought that's a really interesting idea, that, that I, here I am seeking truth, I'm seeking a, uh, an appraisal of reality, and this is what I think, and I'm being attacked for attacking Islam. And I've never been attacked, I've spent years attacking Christianity, and some of those same people were absolutely fine with that, you know, that's fair game. As soon as Islam is attacked um, from fellow lefties like myself, it's seen as a little bit off target, and I wonder why that is. Is it the case that, um, that the left are generally against uh, imperialist America, and therefore imperialist America is against Islam and the enemy of your enemy is your friend. Is there some really interesting dynamic going on there? But anyway, so I thought it would be interesting to, to look into this idea of, of whether Islam, and really tonight isn't so much as understanding Islam as a whole, that's too big a thing to do, but it's understanding the present religious violence in the context of Islam, and does it have anything to do with the content of that religion? Um, so. Islam and Christianity are two pillars of, of world religion. What separates them? Because they're very different. And the way that they deal with, or the way that we look at it in terms of epistemology, which is the study of knowledge in philosophy, is quite different. So Christianity has survived so well because in evolutionary terms it's really, really adapted. There are 42,000 different denominations of Christianity, okay? And it has, as societies progressed over time, Christianity is adapted to society. 
So Christianity has adapted to moral progress, to technological progress, to scientific progress, and to economic progress. And part of that is because the book, the holy book that it's centred on, is the inspired word of God. We don't know who wrote it, we don't know when they wrote it, we don't know where they wrote it, uh, and we can have pretty good guesses at all those, and pretty good guesses about why they wrote it, but it's not the word of God. The core difference here is that Islam is based on the Quran, and the Quran is the direct word of God through the angel Gabriel to Muhammad. So here we have something which has less ability, there's less ability to interpret those words like you can the Bible, which you can cherry pick to fit your own. If you, if you love money, there's a Christianity for you. If you hate money, you know, capitalism, socialism. If you love slavery, there's a Christianity to you, for you. If you hate slavery, if you love gays, if you hate gays, if you love black people, if you hate black people, you can find that in the, in the Bible. You know, it's, it, whatever conclusion you want to draw, you can, you can get from that. The, the Quran is slightly different, and it sits there and expects, or, or Islam sits there and expects society to adapt to it to some larger degree than Christianity. And that underpins the differences and why I think uh, there is uh, more of an issue with Islam uh, seen in that evolutionary context. So the problem is there's a great, uh, there's a myriad, there are myriad different Muslims in the world today, tolerant, liberal, moderate, extremist, okay? Who best represents Islam? Because on the one hand, we say, well, these jihadis who are, who are causing such, such trouble in the Middle East and elsewhere are using violent religious extremism, um, and they are claiming it's in the name of Islam. On the other hand, we have peace-loving Muslims, the majority indeed, who are also claiming to be you know, real and proper Muslims. And, and in philosophy, this is called the no-true-Scotsman fallacy. Which is to say, you know, someone stands up and says, I'm a Scotsman, well, do you like porridge? Yes. Do you, do you like salt in your porridge? No, well, you're not a true Scotsman, sit down. You know, and there's this idea of uh, who actually decides who represents a true Scotsman. So that's a bit of a fall fallacious approach. Well, we have this with Islam. Who best represents Islam and who gets to decide that? And my argument tonight will be that the, the basis of that comes from the Quran and from the role model of Muhammad himself. And therefore, you might not get a true Muslim, but you can get a truer sense of what a proper Muslim might be. So, uh, you hear these, these quotes. These are three quotes in the recent years from men, heads of state around the world. This isn't the real Islam. Uh, this has nothing to do with Islam. Islam is a religion of peace. They are not Muslims. They are monsters. Of course, the jihadis would certainly disagree with that. Um, so, uh, I've, I've got... One admission, uh, there are two very long quotes I am going to read in their entirety tonight. <coughs> Apologies for that. Tough. Um, so, uh, I will come on to that in a second. So, um, that's not to say that politics and other causal factors aren't important in what drives uh, a religious extremist to violence. We are very happy to say that socio-economic uh, degradation, poverty, um, you know, lack of equality, all these things, uh, alienation, can cause people to go towards religious violence. But it's interesting that when you say, well, the content of the Quran also drives that, people go, oh, no, no, no. Hang on, how can you say these other causal factors are responsible, and yet you draw this arbitrary line that, allows, that doesn't allow the Quran to be held in any way responsible? or to have content which can be, can be used to justify such atrocities. And that, to me, is, is a problem. Um, here is a quote uh, about Ibn Warwick, who is uh, an ex-Muslim uh, critic of, of Islam. He says, We are forever being told by apologists for Islam that it is essentially a religion of peace and love. Like all religions, and that anyone using violence in its name, are not true or real Muslims. That this apologia will not wash is made plain by Ibn Warwick in his discussion of the Muslim exegetical technique of Nasr, that means the technique of, of analysing the Quran, or abrogation, whereby according to the traditional chronology of events, early texts or revelations are overruled by later ones. By laying them out in detail, Ibn Warwick shows that the majority of texts recommending clemency and tolerance are abrogated by later ones advocating violent action. It seems that terrorists have as much right to consider themselves good Muslims as any others. And that's really the core of what I've been talking about. So, um, 
basically, Islam can be split toward, from, from my point of view into three, broadly three parts. Um, Muhammad, the Quran, and the adherents today, Muslims today, and their actions. So we start with Muhammad. He was involved in um, 65 military campaigns. He ruled by the sword, he, was nicknamed, he nicknamed his swords things like pluck out death, and was himself called the obliterator. So, you know, you start getting a sense of, of Muhammad as, as a person, as a militaristic ruler. Um, in the Battle of Trench, uh, it decapitated six to 900 men and boys, I think one woman. Uh, so, so when you're looking at the atrocities around the world at the moment, is there some kind of reflection in the role model of, of Muhammad, who was a divine, divine prophet? Um, he enslaved women and children. You know, this all sounds familiar. Now, it's interesting when you compare Muhammad, who was uh, a traitor. I mean, I've given you information on a sheet. I just simply don't have time to go through that. But if you want to learn a little bit about how the Quran was written, uh, it's on there. Um, but if you compare Muhammad to Jesus, Jesus was a turn the other tree, cheek, uh, love thy neighbour socialist. Okay, he was all about you know um, forgiveness and uh, a lot more tolerance, I think, because he wasn't a military leader. He was a socialist revolutionary. Muhammad is a totally different kettle of fish. Muhammad was a military leader who had to fight to get Islam on the map. And as a result, his actions were pretty brutal. And if you are going to look, and, and, and the Quran came out of him, the Quran was a series of revelations over 22 years from a cave, or uh, uh, broadly speaking, um, from God. So he had these reve revelations. Now, to the humanists and the atheists like ourselves, this looks like post hoc rationalisation, which is to say, rationalising after the event. I'm going to go and attack this caravan and kill these people. Oh, I've had a revelation that seems to condone that. How convenient. So there is a sense that the revelations can possibly be seen to the cynic to follow, to, to kind of justify the actions of Muhammad himself in forcing through his worldview. Um, so it's a very, very different kettle of fish. So my first point, very quickly, is to say that if you are looking to the kind of leader of your religion or the role model of your religion, Muhammad, is a militaristic, brutal leader that killed many, many people and came up with lots of rules, supposedly through God, to uh, that had negative impacts on, on large amounts of the population. Um, so the second pillar, if you like, not to be confused with the five pillars of Islam, the second pillar of the approach, my approach to Islam is the Quran. And I don't know, it'd be interesting, how many people here have read the Quran? Okay, a handful, four people. Yeah. So, yes, and uh, that's a really important word because it is so dry. In, in, uh, I do apologise to Muslims who hold a great deer, but it is really quite a dry book and it's very, very repetitive. And it's quite incredible. I went through the second book, actually, the second chapter, Surah Al Baqarah, the, the, the cow, the heifer, and I highlighted all the bits that had a go at disbelievers and unbelievers and polytheists. <coughs> And it was about 50-50. Uh, so in other words, that chapter, the longest chapter in the Quran, dealt as much with non-believers as it did with believers. And that is a recurrent theme throughout. In fact, I came away from reading the Quran feeling dehumanised, which is a really powerful word amongst humanists. I actually felt dehumanised. I felt like I was less, I, I felt not human, not worthy. I, the contempt and scorn poured on the reader or or. or, or unbelievers in the Quran is quite incredible. Now, this is really interesting because then if I put myself in the shoes of a Muslim reading that, how can you have social cohesion when you've got a book that is consistently telling you scornfully about non-believers? And in fact, there's, a, there's one such quote from, from the Quran is here, which is to say, I will not find any people who believe in Allah and the last day loving those who resist Allah and his messenger, even though they were their fathers or their sons or their brothers or their kindred. That's to say, if you're an unbeliever, you cannot be friends, uh, a believer cannot be, a Muslim cannot be friends with a non-Muslim. So you, you get these, the, you can't just ignore claims like this, or, or try and cherry pick your, you know, this is the immutable word of God. And, you know, there's another uh, a claim here that says, no change can there be in the words of Allah. This is indeed the supreme success. So you can't change Allah's words. You can't just like, oh, that was then, this is now. Um, 
you know, as much as 20% of, of the Quran is thought to be, you know, concentrating on unbelievers uh, like ourselves. Uh, so you have, what you do have, you do have contradictions in the Quran. Now, how can you have contradictions? Because it's the immutable word of God. Now, that doesn't change. So what goes on? Well, actually, within the Quran and these other texts called the Hadith, which are written after the Quran, talk about this thing called nasb or abrogation, which is uh, this technique of if there's a contradiction, then the later, chronologically later, text supersedes the earlier one. Now, it's really important to know a little bit of the history of Muhammad here. So Muhammad s set up his preaching in Mecca. He was, he was from Mecca. There was a lot of polytheism. There was a lot of uh, inequality and social injustice. And he set up this. And to get attention and to get followers, he went through the, the love and peace kind of uh, tack. Now, that was all good and well. He got some followers, kept it close to his to himself, and then ended up going elsewhere to sort out the dispute elsewhere, and then started growing more and more in popularity, and this was, he moved to Medina, and while he's in Medina, continued having revelations, he had, he basically became more militaristic, and these, these verses that came out of Medina were the later verses, so the theory of abrogation means that the later, if you've got a contradiction between love and hate, or love and war, Actually, the war abrogates the love. So uh, there's a real movement towards militarism and expansionism as he sought to destroy caravans to have a go at the polytheists in, in Mecca. And eventually he took over Mecca and there's this place, the Kaaba, which is full of idols. A bit like if you've seen in the Middle East recently with the destroying of museums and stuff. That's what they did. You know, when, when so you say that's disgusting that, that the jihadis are doing that, that was one of the core winning moves of Muhammad. He went and destroyed all the idols in Mecca. So, so he moved towards a more militaristic approach. Um, uh, and, you know, the, the Quran is absolutely littered with such verses about death and destruction and uh, generally Jews and, and non-believers and polytheists getting the rough end of the stick. So it's really hard to justify a loving approach to a pluralist society. We're a pluralist society. That means there's a plurality of beliefs. Yeah? And most people in the world are not Muslims, which means that in order to make most people Muslims, I don't know where do you take your, your, your ideas from of how to do that, the Quran and Muhammad, you are invariably going to move towards, I would argue, a more militaristic approach. And as his power base grew, the revelations that he had of violence grew. Um, so, I'm going to read you a big, big quote here, and this is about contextualising. So, in, with the Bible, you historically contextualise. Why, why can't you do that while well, the Old Testament is not relevant anymore because the New Testament's overtaken the Old Testament and this and that, and it's only, it was only relevant for the time it was in. Why can't we do that with is, Islam and the Quran? Well, as I said, it's the immutable word of God that just sticks. You can't cherry pick it. You can't say, I've seen uh, Dean Warner, William Lane Craig, a very famous Christian debater. If he's cornered on the Old Testament and some of the horrors in the Old Testament, he says that the first thing as a believer you can do is drop the fallibility, infallibility of the Old Testament. He doesn't admit to doing that, but he says you can do that. That's a choice you have. You have a choice of saying, well, actually, the Bible is just wrong. It's written by humans, about inspired by God, but they just got it wrong. And in fact, there are empirically lots of mistakes in the Bible of flat-out contradictions. So it literally cannot be all totally correct. Can you do this with Islam and the Quran? Well, I'm going to read this to apologise. There is always the fight of context argument with, his, with Islam's holy text, Quran. The apologetic version is Quran cannot be interpreted and understood except with, it, with its context. This paraphrasing is constantly adduced by Islamic apologists whenever any argument against the violent verses within the text is raised. Is it not implausible to believe in the infinite relevance of the Quran and at the same time rise objections to critiques by embarking a context smokescreen? Should not Muslims give up the context excuse if they want to use Quran as a, ho as a text which is relevance is distended to the end of times? There is only an affirmative answer to these questions. Uh, Gone the wrong way. Oh, that's wrong uh, let us come back to the Quran. Allah spoke to a 7th century Arab in the latter's language, and all what he said to this prophet is recorded to fructify Quran. To side up, Allah sent his last message to his same to the same prophet 
then stop speaking downright, because God sent his last message and promised to preserve it forever. He will not speak anymore until the day of resurrection. He will not send any prophets, and sending a prophet will stir him up again. This is the end. God sent his final messenger, and even though he did not favour immortality to the messenger, he blessed the message with immortality. So Quran, Islam's holy text, is not a pushover. It's the ultimate message of God. There is nothing to add or subtract in it. All of its components are divine, equally divine. All are applied to all and all. In conclusion, if there is a command in Quran, there is no need to look for its historical context, since humanity, from the formation of Quran to the end of times, are living in the context of the text. It is a Muslim belief. God, Gabriel, Muhammad, three key figures formed Quran, have infinite relevance, so the making to necessarily possess the quality of being internally relevant. If this is the common Muslim belief pertaining to Quran, there is no room for a context excuse in its case. Thus, the context excuse in the case of Quran is flawed in its fundamentals. So a long, long quote, I do apologise, but the, the point is, is big. You can't contextualise the Quran. Um, so what does this say about reform? We don't, we don't want to reform the Quran in the same way that there's a Protestant Reformation. Okay? So that was a bit uh, of John Calvin, you know, we don't want to see that happen to it. Is it. We just want a liberal reformation where the religion takes on our progressive moral values. But if you remove the Quran, you start messing with the Quran, there is no Islam, it falls apart. So we're left with this real problematic issue. And that leads me to the third and final pillar, it, are the Muslims and their actions. They are the greatest hope for a kind of reformation. Um, there is a difference between Muslim countries, um, but are there more correct Muslim countries? Are there more correct Muslim countries from a liberal progressive perspective and from an Islamic pers perspective? You know, radicalists, are they not true Muslims in the same way liberals claim to be? So the Quran plus Muhammad equals radicalists closer to the truth, is my opinion. Now, you can seek peaceful verses in the Quran, but there are just as many, if not more, uh, violent and, and, and powerfully destructive verses as well. And, you know, as humans, we say all wrong. But if you are a Muslim, then that's what you've got to go by the Quran and Muhammad. And I just suggest you, if you're in any doubt, read the Quran and have a look into Muhammad's life. So, politics and other factors do cause extremism as well, but the Quran and Muhammad are vital components. One last big quote, and then I'm done, I promise. So, most Muslims are, like other, most other people, essentially decent, kind, and appalled at terrorist violence, yet within Islam is another powerful sentiment, often coexisting with the kindness. A Pew Research study shows that most Egyptian Muslims are whopping 88% think that death is the appropriate penalty for leaving Islam. In Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Pakistan, and Palestinian territories, it's the same sort of case. In Turkey, a much more secular, more conservative country, a solid majority opposes the death penalty for apostates. But there's, even there, there's 17 percent of Muslims who favour it. In Islam, leaving a faith isn't simple apostasy, as Westerners see it, but a form of treason against a larger community. So they see it as appropriate to kill people for such things. The analysis of these numbers is tricky, but they underline an important point. The beliefs and attitudes that promote violence against non-Muslims for offences against Islam are held by a minority of Muslims, but it's not a small minority in terms of absolute numbers. It's probably in the high tens or low hundreds of millions. Okay? That's a lot of problem. But does extreme lose its meaning when nearly half a given population holds a position being described? I'm honestly not quite sure what to make of all this data, and I'm reluctant to land any sort of definitive conclusion pertaining to the internal struggle on this subject. Again, I don't want to fall into the trap of unfairly painting with too broad a brush, nor am I interested in doing the opposite by blithely ignoring data like this, or worse, attacking those who mention it as bigots. Which brings me to question number two. How can anyone fairly examine any of this data when, and then loudly declare that Islamism's worst excesses have nothing to do with Islam itself? It's one thing to argue over whether the tiny fraction narrative is accurate or whether it does more harm than good. It's a dangerous brand of delusion, however, to pretend that Islamist extremism, there's that word again, is entirely divorced from Islam. Many millions of people represented in the statistics above obviously identify as practicing faithful Muslims. Shouldn't that be enough for us, especially based on the left's own standards? And finally, those who insist that Islamist terrorists aren't real Muslims, the approved sensitive position du jour, ought not be offended by this admittedly ugly suggestion. This is quite interesting as a thought experiment. 
Not real Muslims equals no need to treat them as such, right? Shouldn't these same people agree that, say, Guantanamo Bay guards could all deny al-Qaeda detainees access to the, the Quran and special halal diets without violating their human rights? After all, they're violent extremists. They're not real Muslims. Well, who gets to decide that? How do the new true Muslim rules work? I'll close by again conceding that I don't know what the appropriate balance should be when it comes to criticising large elements within Islam. I'm confident, however, that evading the questions I've raised by way of self-righteous preening, I'm saying these things regardless of the facts because I want everyone to know that I'm a compassionate, non-judgmental person, does this important discussion a tremendous disservice and literally endanger the lives. And basically that's where I'm going to leave it, is, is that if you close... Islam off from being able to be criticised I think that's a dangerous game but on the flip side is what do we do if we accept that Islam can't really exist without its extreme, um, extremely violent and social political uh, militaristic roots then where does that leave us with, with a modern society that looks to a pluralist humanist future um, I don't have an answer to that and be interested to hear what you have to say and certainly what David has to say but I'm the depressing one here. Uh, sorry, guys. I think Islam is really quite problematic, and I'm fairly sure that comes from the core tenets of the Quran plus Muhammad. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, thanks for listening. Sorry about the long quotes. <laughs> Yeah, we've got another five minutes. Not yet. <laughs> but we, we've, got, uh, we've got plenty of uh, time for discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Um, and yes, I was just congratulating Jonathan on sticking well within time, so it gives us a little bit more time for questions. Okay. Um, my technical man is just sorting out uh, my slides. Oh, okay, I just need to log in. Oh, yeah, you see that happened. Okay, great. I've got a good gadget. Oh, I'm going to extend the screen. Yeah, I need to function it. Oh, okay. Yeah, there Excellent, thank you very much, Dave. Well, my presentation is a response to Jonathan's blog, which was entitled True Islam and Violent Extremism. And um, I'm relieved to, to discover this evening that his, that his, that his presentation tonight uh, is not a, a million miles away from what you wrote in January. So uh, I think we're, we're sort of addressing the same questions. Okay, so um, the questions that Jonathan um, addressed in this blog. Am I standing in the way of the screen of anyone? Or can everyone... I am standing in the way of it. Okay. Um, okay. Um, just move these around a bit. Sorry, Joe. That's fine. Is that okay? <coughs> You are, is that alright for you, Chris? Just about. Just about, okay, well done. Um, so, the questions that Jonathan addressed. Does Islam as a religion have causal responsibility for Islamic terrorism? Who is a real Muslim and what is the current state of Islam today? Do radicals and jihadis have a more fundamentally accurate picture of Islam than liberal and moderate Muslims, and why has Islam not gone through the sort of theological reformation that Christianity has? Well, Jonathan takes exception to the typical statements that get trotted out after every Islamist atrocity. I'm sure you're uh, familiar with them, and, and Jonathan mentioned them this evening. This isn't the real Islam. This has nothing to do with Islam. Islam is a religion of peace. They're not Muslim, they're monsters. I'm sure we've all, we've all heard this. Well, Jonathan considers and has considered this evening three elements of Islam in order to come to his conclusions. He looks at the text of the Quran itself, the life and character of Muhammad, and opinion polls of Islam. 
In conclusion, it, he wrote this. I posit that fundamentalist Muslims are more fundamentally correct in their faith. What Islam is supposed to be, I wager, is closer to the jihadi version. Liberal and moderate Muslims are contravening the important diktats of the Quran and do not appear to be following in the footsteps of Muhammad. Sharia law does seem to be a natural add-on from the scriptures and most Muslims around the world appear to be in some sort of agreement with that. He also writes, we could adopt some sort of postmodernism, which states that they are all right in some sense, but there must be some sort of accurate representation of what Muhammad set out. Well, I took up Jonathan's uh, challenge to read the Quran. It was part of my holiday reading in the Lake District, and my partner is getting more and more worried about my holiday reading. Uh, he's here tonight. Um, and I have to agree uh, with Jonathan, it was a pretty grim read from the point of view of unbelievers who will suffer all sorts of torments in the life hereafter. Now, uh, the life of Muhammad is rather problematic. Jonathan this evening has, uh, has said quite a bit about the biography of Muhammad. I think this is rather problematic because it's very difficult to know whether we have any reliable information about Muhammad. The first biography we have was written about 200 years after he died, which is a far worse position that we find ourselves in with the Christian Gospels, if indeed you think that the Christian Gospels contain any biographical information about Jesus. I did read A Modern Life of Muhammad by Tariq Ramadan. I like Ramadan's academic writings, but his book on Muhammad was frankly a work of hagiography. So here's my first question to the audience. Who knows what hagiography means? Anyone? Yes, at the back there. Lives of the Saints, yeah, so it's a kind of um, idealised portrait of somebody, uh, not critical. So if you're not, uh, yeah, so, um, so however, it is clear that um, if, if we take uh, the biography that we have of Muhammad at face value, it's clear that unlike Jesus, Muhammad had a private army, and undoubtedly he was involved in at least one brutal massacre which Jonathan mentioned, but I don't think we have time tonight to get any, into any detailed discussion of his moral qualities as a religious leader, although that is part of Jonathan's argument. As for the views of Muslims around the world today, it is of course very difficult to know whether the vast majority, of, mo, whether the vast majority are moderates or extremists, whether a sizable mon minority agree with the extremists. It very much depends on how you define these terms. I'm not sure that the true nature of Islam can be determined by opinion polls, but I agree it's an interesting topic for research and discussion. As a quick digression, I'd like to say something about the word Islamophobia, which has become almost unusable because it's so politicised. There may well be things in Islam of which we are fearful, but I'd like to suggest an alternative word which might be more useful. And the word I have in mind is extremophobia. Now I thought I'd made this word up and I was going to write to the Oxford Dictionary and get, get my name into the history books of, of this word. But of course, as soon as I looked it up on the internet, there was plenty of instances of this word. So do remember this word extremophobia, which means fear of extremism uh, in whatever form we find it. Then if we want to talk separately about unfair discrimination and hostility towards Muslims, we can simply talk about unfair discrimination and hostility without using ambiguous words. Well, moving on, I was tempted to argue that the whole debate about the true nature of Islam, like the true Scotsman, is rather misplaced. In philosophy, this kind of exercise is called essentialism, the idea that we can determine the true essence of something. Postmodernists claim that there is no such thing as the essential truth of something like a text. The best we can hope for is different readings and interpretations. But Jonathan wrote, there must be some sort of accurate representation of what Muhammad set out. Well, fair enough. I'm not saying that anything goes. But what I would say, and I think this is a fair representation of the state of Islam today, is that there is a battle going on for the soul of Islam. If we can reduce it to two sides, I think we've got extremists on one side 
and moderates on the other. And this is not just my view, this is how it's portrayed um, by this academic. Um, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce his name, so you might have to help me out, but uh, let's go for Khalid Abu al Fadl or Fadl. Fadl. Pardon? Fadl. Fadl. Fadi. So you don't pronounce the L. Okay. I might just call him Khalid, actually. That's a bit easier. Um, professor of Law at the University of California. Uh, he wrote a great book. If you want one book um, to read, this is a very readable book and it explains a lot. Uh, the Great Threat, Wrestling Islam from the Extremists. And he characterises Islam today as this kind of um, two sides, extremists versus moderates. Well, what are we to make of Jonathan's position that fundamentalist Muslims are more fundamentally correct in their faith? Liberal and moderate Muslims are contravening the important diktats of the Quran, Jonathan said in his blog. Well, I think the problem lies in Jonathan's phrase, the important diktats of the Quran. Because in this one phrase, Jonathan simply concedes the whole argument to the extremists and wipes out centuries of Islamic philosophy and jurisprudence. If you're not familiar with this word, jurisprudence, uh, it means philosophy of law, if we have any lawyers in the audience. Islam is very similar to rabbinic Judaism in the sense that it is a law-based religion. It doesn't simply read off diktats from the text. What we have are trained jurists and different schools of law who spent centuries arguing over the text and issuing their rulings or fatwas. A fatwa is just a legal ruling or an opinion. In the first two centuries of Islam, there were over 30 different schools of law, and by the 10th century, this number had been reduced down to just four main Sunni schools. But this still represents a significant degree of diversity, with the Hanbali school being the strictest. When we talk about Sharia law, what we're actually referring to in a physical sense is at least 50,000 volumes of legal rulings and a huge diversity of opinion. Strictly speaking, Sharia only exists in heaven, um, and Islamic jurisprudence is merely human striving towards the Sharia. Anyway, to cut a long story short, uh, what's happened in Muslim-majority countries like Egypt over the last couple of centuries is a process of westernisation. In particular, Western law superseded Sharia law and Islamic, ju Islamic jurists and schools of law lost their funding and prestige. We might think of this as progress, westernisation, we might think that, but the un unintended consequence of this is that it left a vacuum in religious authority in modern Islam. So unlike Catholicism, Islam has no pope, and so the situation we have today in terms of religious authority is actually one of chaos. Uh, Khalid calls it a state of anarchy. And so Jonathan may claim that he knows what the authentic Islam looks like, but in the Islamic world itself there's just a massive debate going on. Well what I'd like to do in the uh, little time we have is to take you on a very high speed journey through Islamic history. You've got the handout as well which you can look at at your leisure afterwards. Um, but just, this is just to give you some idea as to how aspects of Islamic pluralism and diversity have played out over the centuries. And we may even stumble across some surprising atheists and sceptics. So one of the key aspects we'll be looking at is the place of critical reason in Islamic jurisprudence. And two of the key principles involved in legal in interpretation of Sharia are, I thought this was pronounced Taklid, but apparently it's Teglud, um, and Ijtihad. So ta Teglud means imitation or authority, and Ijtihad means creative interpretation or using independent judgment. And this, this, this struggle between these two ways of approaching uh, interpretation and Sharia goes right back to the very earliest times. So, 
One of the earliest schools which tried to reconcile reason and revelation were called the Mutazilites, who flourished between the 8th and the, and the 10th centuries in Basra and Baghdad. In response to some of the controversies of the time, their distinctive contribution was to take the middle position between two extremes. They were, not, they were considered to be rationalists, and they believed that the Quran is created, not uncreated. In other words, it was created by, by human beings, just like the Bible. They were ultimately denounced as heretics, but Mutazilism continued to inspire later reformers. Obviously, I think they were right about the Quran being a human product, in exactly the same way that the Book of Mormon is a human product. And sorry, this is a digression, but I couldn't resist this little digression about the similarities between Muhammad and Joseph Smith. <laughs> so, uh, Joseph Smith on the right, um, we don't have any uh, images or photographs of Muhammad on the left there. Now, uh, some, so some similarities. They both received revelations whenever it suited their own purposes. Jonathan mentioned that. Um, Muhammad received his revelations from the angel Gabriel. Joseph Smith received his revelations from the angel Moroni. Both of them enjoyed the privilege of multiple wives. They probably had similar personality profiles. They both had private armies at their disposal. The original Quran is written on a tablet in heaven and the original Book of Mormon was written on golden plates, and so on and so on. Well, I'll leave you to ponder the comparisons and similarities between these two figures, but I thought they were rather interesting. You may also be interested to hear about a Persian freethinker called Ibn al-Rawandi. He started out as a Mutazilite and ended up as a complete sceptic and an atheist. Another Persian figure, al-Razi, um, 10th century was the most famous and widely respected Islamic authority on medicine in the medieval world. He was a rationalist and an anti-religionist. Not surprisingly, he was condemned as a heretic and a blasphemer. A more conservative figure was al-Ashari, who was born in Basra and died in Baghdad. He's the founder of the Asherite school of theology. The Asherites were not opposed to reason, but they promoted a more conservative theology which ultimately prevailed over the new Tazalites. We should also remember at this point that the Al-Azhar University in Cairo was one of the oldest universities in the world. Founded in 970, it predates Oxford by at least a century, and its students studied the Quran, Islamic law, along with logic, grammar and rhetoric. We should also mention that in the 10th and 11th centuries, Cordoba in Muslim Spain was one of the most advanced cities in the world. The city had 3,000 mosques, splendid palaces, 300 public baths, and the largest library in the world. Well worth a visit uh, if you get a chance to go to Cordoba. Well, I think it's fair to say that most of us, including many Muslims, are pretty ignorant about the achievements of Islamic civilization and the contributions it made to science, philosophy, medicine, maths and astronomy. The clues are in the names of the things which have come down to us. Algorithms. I only found out at the weekend what an algorithm was, thanks to Simon at the back there. Thank you, Simon. Um, algebra, alkali, and ironically, even alcohol. Um, the president of the British Humanist Association is called Jim Al-Khalili um, and he's written a book celebrating the golden age of Arabic science so you may want to follow up on that book. <coughs> so when people talk about the clash of civilizations, they should remember that Islamic civilization predated the Renaissance and was one of the building blocks of what we now call Western civilization. Okay, coming into the 11th century, Ibn Sina, you may, if you've studied philosophy, you, you will know him as Avicenna. Uh, he was a polymath who made contributions to medicine, maths and philosophy. He tried to reconcile reason and religion through allegorical interpretation. And one of my favourite figures from this period is Al-Mari, uh, a blind poet who sport, poured scorn on religion. He thought that kissing the black stone was superstitious nonsense. Uh, he was charged with blasphemy, but he escaped prosecution. Um, so this is the Kaaba in, uh, in Mecca, the cube-shaped 
uh, shrine, and the black stone is set in the uh, in the corner there, and it's believed to be a meteorite. So because it, uh, this stone fell from heaven, uh, the Muslims uh, think uh, thought that it was um, uh, from heaven. Okay, uh, whilst we're about it, let's chuck in um, a gay poet from the 9th century. Abu Nuas is considered a great lyric poet, and his twin passions were wine and beautiful boys. Um, a poem attributed to him in the perfumed garden speaks of the joys of sodomy, but perhaps we'll draw a veil over that one this evening. So I'm going to share a different poem with you. Accumulate as many sins thou canst, the Lord is ready to relax his ire. When the day comes, forgiveness thou wilt find, before a mighty king and gracious sire. And nor thy fingers, all that joy regretting, which thou didst leave through terror of hell, hell fire. So in other words, sin as much as you like, because God is merciful, and when you get to the other side, he will forgive you. So that was his take on um, the hereafter. In the 12th century, we meet the hugely important figure of Al-Ghazali, who died in 1111, incredibly, at 11 minutes past 11 o'clock um, on the 11th of November. I made up that last bit, sorry. Um, anything for a quick laugh. Um, he's been referred to by some historians as the single most influential Muslim after Muhammad. Unfortunately, he attacked reason and philosophy in favour of revelation. His most famous book is The Incoherence of the Philosophers, so there's clues in the title. A rather more appealing figure to us in the 12th century was Ibn Rashid, known to us, if you've, again, if you've studied philosophy, as Av Averroes. He was one of the greatest commentators on Aristotle, and he believed in both reason and revelation. His counterblast to Al-Ghazali was the incoherence of the incoherence. <laughs> well, everything started to go wrong in 1258 with the Mongol invasions and the sack of Baghdad. The Ottoman Empire lasted from 1299 until 1924, but from the 16th century onwards, the opening of new sea routes to the Americas and South Asia bypassed the Muslim world. This led to colonial empires and the decline of Islamic civilization. So I'm going to fast forward now to the 18th and 19th centuries and introduce you to some more seminal figures, one fanatic and four liberals. So here's our, here is our fanatic. Uh, Abd al-Wahhab, the founder of Wahhabism which is the Saudi school of puritanical Islam, also known as Salafism, from the word Salaf, which means ancestors. His aim was to purify Islam by returning Muslims to the original principles of their religion. His pact with Muhammad bin Saud helped to establish the first Saudi state. There's a kind of codependency between the rulers of Saudi Arabia and Wahhabism, which still continues today and the Saudis have aggressively exported Wahhabism around the globe. And it's actually very difficult for any Muslim anywhere to dissent from Wahhabi doctrine, because if you do, the Saudi authorities can refuse your visa application to visit the holy sites of Mecca and Medina. Well, our first liberal in this period is Shah Wali Allah, um, is an Islamic scholar who emphasised the importance of reason and the principle of ijtihad, uh, to remember is independent judgment or creative interpretation. And he said this, the time has come for the religious law of Islam to be brought into the open, fully dressed in reason and argument. And he was a major influence on later exponents of liberal Islam. Our second liberal is al-Afghani. He was one of the founders of Islamic modernism. If a man, and he said this, if a man believes things without proof or reason and is satisfied to follow his ancestors, his mind inevitably desists from intellectual movement and little by little stupidity and imbecility overcome him. Rather delicious quotation. Our third liberal, Mohammed Abdur, uh, Egypt, a scholar and liberal reformer, also one of the founders of Islamic modernism. 
sometimes called neo-Mutazilism, after the Mutazilites. And by the early, early 20th century, um, liberals were in charge of the Al-Azhar University in Cairo, uh, which became a focus for liberals to visit and study. Another leading modernist scholar was Al-Qasimi, uh, Syrian. He referred to Taglud as a leprosy which has spread widely among the people, a general paralysis, a stupefying lunacy, plunging man into apathy and indolence. Well, some people had high hopes for Islamic modernism in the 1920s, but after the end of the Ottoman Empire in 1924, modernism was eclipsed by nationalism, socialism and hardline revivalism, as represented in new organisations such as the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, which was founded in Egypt by Hassan al-Banna, its goal is to make the Quran and Sunnah the sole reference point for ordering the life of the Muslim family, individual, community and state. Its mottos include Islam is the solution, Allah is our objective, the Quran is the constitution, the Prophet is our leader, Jihad is our way, death for the sake of Allah is our wish. Another key organisation is jamaat e islami which means Assembly of Islam, an Islamist political party founded by Mordoudi. Its objective is to make Pakistan an Islamic state governed by Sharia law. And I need to mention one more seminal figure on the Islamist front, Saeed Qutb, uh, a leading member of the Muslim Brotherhood, he wrote Milestones uh, in 1964, which is an influential Islamist tract. This was another bit of my um, holiday reading. Um, I don't recommend these books necessarily for re relaxation. Um, and this lays out a plan to recreate the Muslim world on strictly Quranic grounds. He was executed in 1966 for plotting to assassinate the Egyptian president. Abd al-Wahhab is a kind of Islamic version of John Calvin. Wahhabism is a fundamentalist, evangelical uh, and violent creed or version of Islam. It disregards centuries of Islamic philosophy and goes back to the Quran and reads off whatever it wants to from the original texts. It's very similar to Christian fundamentalism except that it's much more violent and extremist uh, and intolerant. According, according to our uh, scholar um, Khalid, uh, in the University of California, the original Wahhabis carried out 40,000 public executions and 350,000 amputations. The second question posed by Jonathan, do radicals and jihadis have a more fundamentally accurate picture of Islam than liberals and moderates? Well, as I said earlier, no one in the Muslim world can give a definitive answer to this question because no one is in charge of global Islam. It's a free-for-all. But in terms of how Islam has been understood for most of its history, the answer to this question is no. For most of its history, Islam has been pluralistic and tolerated a diversity of opinion. al wahhabs own brother, Suleiman, thought that many of the beliefs and practices of Wahhabism were an aberration and a corruption of mainstream Islam. Um, Khalid acknowledges that Wahhabism has become extremely influential throughout the Muslim world today because of its control of Mecca and Medina, but he maintains that the majority of Muslims are moderate, not extreme. Well, I think I've answered the third question now, who is a real Muslim? What's the current state of Islam today? So moving on to the fourth question, does Islam as a religion have causal responsibility for Islamic terrorism? Well, I think this places causality in the wrong place. I think the primary cause of Islamic terrorism, as with any form of terrorism, is the sense of powerlessness and alienation felt in a given community. Sociologically, Islamism is a predictable response to the identity crisis felt by many Muslims in the modern world, but of course it's not the only possible response, and I'm not seeking to excuse it in any way. The fact that the foundational texts of Islam can be mined for extremist views is secondary and incidental, because this is not the way that the Quran and Sunnah 
have been have traditionally been handled. Historically speaking, Islamist extremism is an aberration and it's a catastrophe that, is, that it has become so powerful through the agency of the immensely rich Saudis. One of the solutions is, of course, to reduce our dependency on oil. So when you next get the chance, please say yes to the Navis, Navitas Bay wind farm. <laughs> well, I'd like to conclude with a couple of quotations from Tariq Ramadan and um, Khalid, which express some potential common ground between Muslims and humanists. Uh, Tariq Ramadan first. Many Christians, Jews, Buddhists, <coughs> agnostics and atheists are inspired in their social and political commitments by their religious, humanist and ethical convictions. All human beings must seek to live and to nourish and give meaning to what constitutes their humanity. To express their values in order to achieve good, we have numerous values in common that invite us to enter into commitments side by side. And Khalid, I have be, become convinced that the Puritan or extremist end of the spectrum empties Islam of its moral and ethical content. I become convinced that a, non, that a non-humanistic Islam is a false Islam, that Islam is a message of compassion, mercy, love and beauty, and that these values represent the core of the faith. Well, Jonathan, I think if we insist that true Islam is extremist Islam, that makes us part of the problem. I know you are motivated by a disinterested search for truth, and I respect that. But looking at the whole history of Islam, I don't think you are completely wrong, but I think we can be more optimistic about the true nature of Islam. And I think as humanists, instead of being part of the problem, we can be part of the solution. Thank you and salam alaikum. <laughs> okay, well, um, I don't know if Jonathan wants to come back at me or anything, or anything that uh, I can't come back at him. We're going to have some questions from the floor as well. But perhaps, first of all, if there's anything you want to... If we, if we have a bit of an exchange, and then we definitely will get to your questions. Okay? I might have a couple of things. <laughs> um, I think one of the key aspects to this is the battle for the soul that you talked about. Yeah. So the battle for the souls of Muslims. And what's actually going on is that the liberal and moderate Muslims are those who put the community, the moral community frameworks, or the moral frameworks that they hold first. So when you talked about westernised Muslims, what, what that actually means is Muslims who are happy enough to relegate the Quran and Islam to a secondary position. So their lives are not dictated by the Quran or by Quranic values, that, that certain Quranic values that they find. And with the extremists, what they do is they put the Quran first and the idea of Muhammad first. So really, this is this is so this kind of plays into the, uh, the the truer type of Muslim being the radicalist because they're literally putting uh, they're living their life more strongly by the Quran and by Islam. And <coughs> those moderates are relegating it past the, the the progressive moral values that society has around them. What would you say to that? Uh, well, first of all, I think I'd say that it sounds as though you're an apologist for Wahhabism, uh, which is a very nasty thing to say, but, you know, anyway, I've, I've said that, I won't say anything really any worse than that. Um, well, well, actually, no, that's an interesting thing to talk about. Okay, go on. When you have clear, thing, clear verses in, in the text which say you cannot be friends with non-Muslims, well, that's not Wahhabism. You know, 100,000 Hindus were killed, I think, in 1199 or 1299 by uh, under Tinur. You know, these, there were ter terrible, terrible atrocities. You've got to remember, Wahhabism also came with technological advances such that killing was easier, right? But in the olden, olden times, you know, you had swords to kill people. And still 100,000 people were killed in one particular instance, and atrocities took place throughout history. So I think the idea that Wahhabism is this sudden, like suddenly Islam has turned violent in the last 100, 200 years, I think is a, I, I think is a bit of a misnomer. Okay, 
Um, I want you to well, I, okay. Well, I, yeah, part of my argument is that modern Islamism does go back to Abd al Wahhab. But okay, we could look at earlier precedents for for that, and I'm sure I'm sure there are plenty. Um, well, when I read people like Tariq Ramadan, I don't know if uh, any of you have read read his books. I mean, they're they're they are quite heavy going, quite academic. All the way through, he's talking about text and context, text and context. And he's saying that this is the way that Isla Islamic uh, legal jurists have approached these texts um, throughout history. So I think you know, there are two ways to approach this. There is the fundamentalist way of approaching the text and just, just go straight back to them and just read off what it says and say, well, the plain meaning of that is X, Y, Z, you know, kill apostates or whatever. Uh, and I would say that that's pretty similar to what fundamentalist Christians do. They, go, they just go back to the text. In fact, um, in Christianity, there's even less chance for interpretation because you don't have centuries of legal interpretation like you do in, in Islam. So I, th I think... Contrary to what you know, the, the narrative that you're putting forward, or the argument that you're putting forward, I think there's more scope within Islam for um, interpretation. I mean, just one of the things that, um, one of the interesting things that Tariq Ramadan says about the Quran is that it, when he analyses it, he tries to identify the key principles. So rather than looking at the specific things that they did back in the 7th century, he, he's always trying to identify the key principles, which, lo and behold, do line up with you know, the kind of ethics that, that humanists would have found. But those are the key principles you're cherry-picking, because what about the key principles? Of, I mean, you've read the Quran, right? Yeah. Every single page denigrates non-believers like properly scornfully I mean this isn't just the like oh by the way non-believers aren't very nice it's literally every single page mm -hmm. and so and and to, to, to have to pray for recite, make recitations five times a day which will include I hate effectively I hate non-believers God hates non-believers they're all going to burn in hell and if I if, you know it is my moral obligation to have jihad against blah 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 I think how difficult must that actually on a pragmatic basis be for Muslims to have a proper socially cohesive approach to a pluralist society it's, I, it, it, I couldn't believe reading it that, that it was so flagrant ok I, I agree it's a problem um, I mean, a couple of things I would say about that is that my understanding is that Millions of Muslim children across the world are brought up to recite the Quran, not understanding a word of what it actually says, because they don't know Arabic. So the Quran itself is this kind of object, this kind of religious object, rather than necessarily informing directly what they believe. But then they're not true Muslims, and they're not even understanding the Quran. I mean, that's kind of my point. Okay, well you keep coming back to this, not true Muslims. But, you know, I, I have a problem with uh, with framing it in that way, but. Um, I think the problem will exist as, for as long as the Quran exists. I mean, the text, I mean, the real basis of my point is that the text is actually not a nice text. I agree, I agree. And, and if you have that as your holy book, I, I, I think there are some fundamental issues that are going to be really difficult to get over. Because, especially if, if you have this basic idea that the Quran is the immutable word of God in some way. I mean, we can call it, there's some great, the problem is like the great critical scholars that, that, that are around are few and far between and they have to write on the student. So Luxembourg at the moment is a guy that's saying, well, actually a lot of these words are, are, are mistranslated Syriac words. And, and uh, there's a lot of um, purchase in these ideas that actually the Quran isn't as solid as you think. That's great. However, you start doing that, it will crumble. So that's why these people are getting no purchase in the Islamic scholar scholastic world because you start accepting that, it falls apart very quickly. So if you want to retain that strong Muslim identity, then you need the Quran to be this brick which you can't you can't chip away at. But they, t <laughs> well, I mean, um, I think I would just say that you know, centuries of. Um, 
legal tradition have not meant, not necessarily chipped away at it, but have interpreted it in different ways. Let me just make a couple, couple more points about this, and then we will open it up, I think, to the floor. When I read the Quran, and all, you're quite right, all of these terrible things being said about unbelievers, it became very clear that what the Quran was talking about, and again, this, this doesn't make it much better, but it makes it a little bit better, the Quran was talking about wicked, evil people. It's not talking about kind of modern humanists, you know, we may be unbelievers in this room, but the Quran wasn't addressing ethical humanists. Um, it's very clear from what it's saying that when it's talking about unbelievers, it's talking about wicked people. Okay, so when I, when I realised that, I thought, well, this isn't actually addressing me as, a, as an atheist humanist, as an ethical humanist. So I didn't get quite the same reaction, or at least that, to me, that was some shield against what it was saying. So that's just one point. Um, the other point is just going back to this idea of cherry picking. In one part of your talk, you said, and not that this is your view, but the Quran is the immutable word of God. But in the other part of your talk, you're saying about this principle of abrogation, so that the, the, the more um, ethical, perhaps, uh, surahs from the Meccan period are abrogated from the more violent Medinan period. Well, how can the Quran abrogate itself? You know, that in itself is cherry picking. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of agree actually. I mean, the problems with the holy texts are, as an atheist, it's very easy to go, well, you've got a big problem there. Yeah. The apologists, I, I think there are ways around that, and, and the, there's internal justification for abrogation within the Quran and also the Hadith go into it even more explicitly. So it, it, it's kind of, sort of thought through and it's coherent, at least to the Muslims themselves. You know, whether that stands up to to a higher criticism from outside, I don't know. And, you know, I, I think it's, yeah, the whole idea of this, this God that comes down and says, uh, or, you know, doesn't come down and self sends a messenger, and, and, and everything in the whole world is on God's command. So over and over in the Quran, again, you know, nothing happens but without God's will. And that includes sin. No, there, there's a lot of so you know you can actually pick apart the theology and the philosophy of it, saying actually it doesn't make a lot of sense on a lot of grounds. However, you know that's easy for us to say because we can just like chuck it out. But but for the Muslim, obviously they then have to do mental gymnastics to get around that. And yeah, that's not to say there aren't those problems for them. There are clearly. I mean, I could go to town on all the kind of questions I ask to God and, and cri criticize about Christianity are equally applicable to the to the Muslim God. Well, so, you know, there are problems within the text for sure. Okay, so you've heard um, Jonathan's presentation, my presentation. You see we're coming at this from slightly different angles. Um, not totally in disagreement, but there are some clear differences. Arm wrestle. But yeah, oh that's right, I forgot to say that at the end of the evening we're going to settle this by arm wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> so don't, don't go before the end. <laughs> now, um, yeah, he's been, he's been, uh, look at those boys, so Okay, um, Simon, have you got the, um, no, you haven't yet got, so Dave is going to give the microphone. Okay, so the rules of engagement are, you can't speak unless you have the microphone and just hold it steadily to your mouth. So John is first. John. Oh, I don't, is it off? Hang on. Hello, hello. Yes, as I said, what an honour. Um, it, it seems to me that the, you are almost, well, clearly you're, uh, you're, the two of you are, are approaching it from different standpoints. Jonathan is talking about the text, and, and uh, David is talking more about the history of Islam and the interpretation of the text. You're going back to the fundamentals of the text. Now, I mean, and, and David hasn't really, as far as I can see, challenged you on, on the actual wording of the text. So, so these different. Now, if, if you have to choose between those two approaches, uh, I, I'd rather go along with David simply because it's a more hopeful uh, interpretation. I absolutely agree. Yeah. And if you look at the, the history of Islam and the interpretations of, of, of that history, I and mean, there have been 
terrible things going on in Islam, the same as there have been in Christianity. Uh, in medieval times, probably Christianity was responsible for war, uh, uh, terrible atrocities like uh, the, um, the, the uh, action against the Cathars, for example, you know, wiping out whole communities. Um, but you know, both both of them both of them did that. Uh, it, and, and I, th- I think um, uh, David was quite right to point to the fact that. Uh, there was a, a great period of, of uh, Islam as far as uh, learning and, and, and return to the sort of um, uh, the, the, the wisdom of the, um, the, the, under, the knowledge of the Greeks and the Romans uh, we, we, we get largely through Islam. So, I mean, it, it just seems to me that if, 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 we're, if we're to... I, I'd like to come out of this in, in, in some sort of optimistic frame of mind and, and, and how we can move forward rather than saying, well, Islam, if we simply say Islam is awful because the book's awful, then, then that seems to be, I'm not quite sure where we go from there. If we say, well, this is the history of Islam and there have been periods in that that we can hang on to and, and, and you know, go back to, which uh, in, and we can also... Sorry, I'm going on a bit here, but we can also um, look in a sociological sense, maybe, at the, the uh, as again, I think you were, David, uh, at the reasons why um, that there, there's such extremism and such uh, desperation, for example, in the Palestinians at the moment, and that's very easy to understand. I think you can go through, you can put lots of things or try and encourage lots of things. So. Um, uh, institutions of, of education actually uh, really supporting critical exegesis or critical analysis of the Quran. So there's, li- there's just not enough of it happening. So Islamic, you know, 100% of Islamic scholars believe that, that Muhammad, you know, the, the traditions, the Muhammadan traditions, pretty much 100% almost of Islamic scholars believe believe those traditions of of the, the, the genesis of the Quran, right? That's not the same for, for Christianity. You've got atheists doing, uh, you know, Christian studies and theology. You've got a whole uh, myriad of, of people. And so I think we need to encourage critical analysis. But at the end, it, it, you still are always going to have this issue that the Quran will sit there and be, even if it's just an excuse for a lot of unhinged people, it's a really easy excuse to do bad things because it's quite simply in the book and Muhammad's actions were his actions. So you, you're always going to have an excuse for some extremists to fulfill you know, what they think is their destiny. So we can put loads of things in place, but the struggle I don't think will ever go away fully. And which is why you've seen it go like this. You know, how many of those wonderful fingers that David mentioned were done over his heretics? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But the, the great thing is that Christianity can just be cherry picked to oblivion. And in, in a sense, Christianity now suffers because it's diluted. And Islam succeeds because it's purer in some kind of sense. Uh, uh, how do we deal with that? Yes, Estelle, if you can uh, just take the microphone. Yes. I agree with that, but I wonder sometimes if it's not an individual thing. You've got the strong belief that you, you know, it's hard for people that don't have huge consuming beliefs. And any change to it or any questioning brings about a fear. And I think it can be like a communal fear. They don't want it questioned. Because once you start asking the questions, it like unravels. And the whole thing unravels. And you're, for some people, that feeling your life's gone or the world's gone, it's a huge thing. Whereas the people that can put the religion precious but to one side and live their life, they don't have that feeling. And the scary thing is the fundamentalists are not afraid to die. Is it all right then to answer? Yeah, sorry. Sure. There's two really, really interesting points there. First of all, as an anecdote, I've got a friend, one of my best friends, is that was used to be a fundamentalist Christian, did a theology degree, um, and has done lots of philosophy, and has also just started a psychology master's. And I can see his, I saw his Christianity unravelling. 
by how he could critically analyse it. And then that was the source of his unravelling, not as a person, actually he's become, you know, flourished as a person. Um, so that's really interesting, I actually agree with you, but there's something else to throw into the mix as well, and this goes for all religions, and it's something I don't know if anyone knows much about psychology of religion, it's something called terror management theory. Now terror management theory is phenomenally interesting, because it says that if someone, say, say you're a, a Christian uh, creationist, right, and I'm presenting to you some evidence, rational evidence for evolution. What I'm actually doing to, to you is I'm presenting something which is threatening your immortality. Uh, and so therefore, when you are judging this evidence uh, and you are considering the doubt of your own position, what you are doing is accepting uh, that you will not live forever. So you cannot fairly judge that. And it's, it's the biggest bribe to retaining a religious position. And unfortunately, as great as humanism is, and as, as correct, I think, as atheism is, it cannot offer that. We can't go up to people and say, We're thinking you're of changing that, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just <laughs> just, just, just lie. <laughs> Let's just know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> atheism 2.0. Yeah, yeah, yeah but you live forever. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> I think that's a remark that a philosopher made, that um, a philosophy Philosophy does not provide a cushion for the soul. No, 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 that's a wonderful quote. Okay. We um, just go, yeah. We've got 73 virgins, isn't that right? Yeah, 73. <laughs> just so yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and beautiful boys as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I you want that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just, just one thing came to my mind then when you said that, Estelle. Um, one of the hopeful things that. Um, Oh dear, my mind's just gone blank. Um, <laughs> who was the speaker that we had? Um, Alon Shah. Yeah. He said that most Muslims are Church of England Muslims. And what he, I think you know what he means by that. Yeah, sort of wishy washy kind of. But that's exactly what I'm saying. They're the sort of Muslims that put the, the societal moral values first. Yeah. And Islam second. Yeah. But that's a kind of hopeful sign. But yes, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Richard, and then, um, yeah, at the back there. Thank you. Uh, David, you wound up by saying something along the lines of humanists um, being able to become part of the solution instead of part of the problem. Yeah. Can, can you sort of repeat that sentence? Have you got it written down then, or do you remember exactly what you said? Well, I can expand on what I mean by that. So I. Well, I hang, hang on, David, please. Yeah. That, that's the point, really. It, it, it seemed to me. To be honest, a little bit of a platitude, and, and I wonder how on earth we might set about actually yeah. doing something yeah, like okay. that. Yeah, okay. So, so uh, being part of the problem, I mean, I think, you know, without being rude to, to Jonathan, I think Jonathan's stance here is part of the problem by saying this is the true Islam and it's terrible. Um, I think part of the solution is to re it's for humanists to recognise that there are scholars maybe if you're far between, but there are scholars, there are thinkers within contemporary Islam and right the way back through Islamic history who are interpreting Islam in a more moderate, dare I say, humanistic way. And, you know, I don't minimise the problems that Jonathan has set out. They are definitely problems. But what I'm trying to do is say, well, look, there are lots of Islamic thinkers who, who don't think like that. And whether you, whether you think that their, their arguments are illogical or going away from true Islam or whatever, I think, you know, I think as humanists, those are the people we can, we can encourage, we can build bridges with, we can say, yeah, that's, that's, you know, there is a different side to this. I think if, you know, there's a real danger of everyone thinking Islam is terrible, Islam is Wahhabism, and this actually makes Muslim people um, more alienated from mainstream society. And that is a real problem, I think. So that's, does that help a bit? I get that. That's really interesting. So I, there is definitely a tension between this understanding that... So if I was to believe, which I do, that my points are true in some kind of way, 
then David is saying that the truth hurts, so let's kind of suppress the truth to a degree. So well, I'm, that, not, I'm not, I'm not, yeah, all right, no, but, I'm not saying that. Uh, yeah, I know, but, but, it, right. but it, it seems a bit <laughs> like that, but, but I kind of agree with that. It's difficult. It, 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 but it is really difficult because, yeah. uh, and I get that, and this is part of my own personal dilemma, is that I understand that what I'm saying is prickly and people don't like it, and it might, as you say, as a byproduct, accidentally alienate people but on the other hand you know we can't and I know we've got to do other things to to stop that alienation but you know there's this tension between the truth being kind of suppressed or something or being minimized uh, and I don't know whether that in the long term success of finding a, a progressive moral society whether that will work but but I do get what you're saying yeah okay okay uh, yes just at the back there yeah Hi, um, I think uh, if I make it simple before I give some insights, uh, it's very simple. Islam is the only religion that is still going out there to kill in the name of God. Christianity stopped, like uh, this guy said, uh, sorry, you know, uh, uh, in the Middle Ages. Uh, uh, and um, I, I don't see any other religion who go out there, send some people, and kill in the name of God. They are the only one who do it. No, they are doing it according to a book, the Koran. As you said, it's reputable and it's dry, but I, I would say someone who studied it, there is, um, most of it is preaching to kill. Kill, destroy, kill. Kill the one who don't believe, don't be friends of them, kill the town who doesn't do uh, uh, Islam, and so on, so on. So it's always kill and do and destroy. So that's why we see those extremists today that they go out there and kill because that's what they read in the Quran. It's a very the easy same, excuse for them, yeah. Exactly. The same Quran that does good Muslims sitting and study and living accordingly to, to, to that book. Now, I can tell you in two minutes time some insights that I've seen. I grew up with Muslims. Bri briefly, please. Briefly, two minutes. I grew up with Muslims. I speak the language. I know the culture. I study the Quran. Now, I saw in my own eyes things that not to do with terror. I'll tell you things in daily life. A woman who was abused by her husband is not allowed by law to go and complain. The court will not hurt her. Hurt her. <coughs> Sorry. Secondly, uh, a brother is proud to kill his sister because she went on a date. Now you'll be shocked, but Google it and you will see. I come from the Middle East. I saw it in my own eyes. I, 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 I wanted to stay away from the hadith and some of the... But, but I, I absolutely get what you're saying and, and, and there are issues with inequality uh, and there are issues with just pure... So there was... Oh, I must find it, I'm sure. Oh, I, I'm, I'd have to get these and find it. There was a really interesting ex-Muslim who, who, who wrote an article saying if we swapped the words in the Quran, took a Quranic text, and he said if we swapped some of these words out and put... Um, atheist or something or Christian in there, we would this would be seen as a hate text. It was really, really interesting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. And it was a very, very good article and he basically just said, this is a hate text if you change these words uh, from unbelievers to atheists or something like that, or, or you know, change a couple of the key words so that, that you recontextualise it. And, and to me, that was really, really powerful. That was one moment where I sat back and thought, if I saw that, yes, I would say that that text was not acceptable for society these days. And I wouldn't want my child reading that. So, and I think that's a problem, as I wouldn't want them reading the Old Testament. David. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to add Is that okay? Yeah. I'd just like to have your views on you know, the, the more current political situation and where it's going. You know, um, the We've attacked Iraq, we've gone into Afghanistan, all Islamic countries, we've stood on the sidelines, perhaps justifiably, why things are happening in Syria, we've bombed Libya, we seem to have a penchant for depriving the Palestinians of their rights. Now how does this impact on people who follow Islamic religion and what do they think of us because of 
our actions or inactions. The other thing I was probably was a sideline. I'm be quite interested to see what the Chilcot report says about what the wise guy in the Foreign Office was saying to the government about you know, the Islamic religion and what would happen in Iraq if what happened did happen and we can see what has happened, you know, suddenly this ISIS appears. Blimey, where does it come from? I mean, it's a total failure of our, our system of, of monitoring. I, I, I'm just completely staggered by how it happened. That's a massive question, David. You've yeah. opened up there, Jonathan. Over to you. Uh, <laughs> world politics in two minutes. Uh, we bugged it up, uh, but broadly speaking, we bugged it up actually. So it's we kind of shot our stuff in, in, in a foot at quite a few opportunities. I think um, the amount of money we're pouring into war. That you often hear this this statement, and it's true. You know, to sort of, they've got to sort out their own problems. So uh, the problem is how do we facilitate that because they're going to struggle with the complete the Middle East is falling apart in, in infrastructure and this and that. You know, certainly from our, our own country's point of view, you know, um, who's it? Uh, Majid Nawaz and what's his organisation? My bank. Quillian, Quillian. Quillian. So we want to put in billions of pounds into Quillian. Literally, like take the bombs out of here and all that money we're spending on that and whack that in Quillian because those kind of uh, organisations will eventually secularise, or they're the, the best chance of secularising Islam. And, and that's what I would suggest we need to do, but th that you need that around the world. It's really difficult because wrapped up in this, you've got oil, you've got money, you've got the Saudis, the Saudi royal families, or Wahhabism. You've got so many issues that, that, that are huge to unpick on, the, on, on their own. That, it's, it's, we are getting to a stage where it's, it's, it's looking impossible to solve with anything like the next 10 years. The, um, the academic from the University of California, Khalid, uh, in his book, he talks about a counter jihad, you know, which is exactly what Jonathan was just saying, you know, pouring money into organisations like Quilliam, for example, um, which is countering um, Wahhabism, you know, and, and maybe that's one way forward but there's yeah. an interesting point actually Ibn Warwick who's very interesting to listen to and read it I, I'd like to read some of his books I haven't yet but he advocates um, he states that we're just not strong enough in standing up for what, what we stand up for right so we, we, we it's all about you know America against Islam but what about having allegiance to rights and allegiance to, to world views and, and what we think are good and right moral frameworks we need to be bloody robust and stand up and say, do you know what, this is good and and we are proud to, to fight, not, not militaristically, but to, to fight for those rights and for those good things that, that humanists certainly all stand for. We just need to be stronger in, 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 in saying that thing. Yes, Gary. It's on, it's on, Gary, just speaking to it, yeah. Yeah, well, what Jonathan has just said, I mean, I think he's absolutely right. I mean, I think that we're under attack. We're under, a, we're under attack from Islam, not just militant Islam, not just ISIS. The very, I can give examples briefly, the Salman Rusty affair. Salman Rushdie was protected by our security services for over 10 years because hundreds, maybe even thousands of Muslims went on the streets. They should have been arrested, advocating the death of Salman Rushdie, violating our laws, everything that we stand for, our tolerance, our laws, our freedom of speech. We're under attack all the time in France recently. Uh, that was really interesting with Salman Rushdie because yeah. he, he was actually not defended by a lot of left liberals mm -hmm. like myself. It was uh, I, I only re heard about this more recently because I can't, can't really remember it that well because I'm so dashing and young, right? <laughs> but, um, but, but it turns out that the, the people I look up to, you know, a ended up being the liberal left that actually stood up for our comedy and 
it was this weird scenario that again you had like the, the right, uh, the political can right I, actually you, standing up for something. Can I say something else? Sorry, yeah. When the Twin Towers was attacked and over 3,000 people were killed, among them of course Muslims, Jews, Christians, atheists, when that was attacked, the Muslims in the world applauded it. Gary, I'm going to stop you there because okay, it just, we just need to be really careful that we don't say that you know a media image of some Muslims applauding that is the whole of Islam. No, of course not. I'm so not, no, I'm not. Just need I'm to not, be really careful. I'm not saying that. Okay. I'm saying that there was vast support throughout the Muslim world. Not all Muslims. Not all Muslims are promised. The fact is that our security services. They're not looking at the Sikhs, they're not looking at the Hindus, they're not looking at the Jews in this country as being a threat. But the threat in this country comes from Islam. Whether we like it or whether we don't, we've got to defend the values, and I agree with Jonathan, we've got to defend the values that I uphold. The values okay. that I uphold. Okay. I, I, I would I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, okay. yeah. That's but my opinion. I, I, I just want to come back and say, the threat is from Islamist extremism. Okay, I just think we need to be really careful about. I'm not so sure I agree with that. Okay, but that's what I. That's what my position would be. Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, it will take time to understand. It will take time to the world to understand. Okay, Aaron, and then Dave. Would it not be a good idea if the world, the Western world, whoever, could somehow encourage the, the Muslim population to have a figurehead like the Pope, who would probably speak for the majority of the Muslims on the moderate, nicer side, so that then there would be somebody to keep them in order in some way, or to advise them with some sort of leadership? I'm, I'm quite strange and astonished that they've gone leaderless for so long. Now. Was, was there a leader at some point, or has this been a whole long time thing? Ne well, never really had a, they'd never had a papacy, an equivalent of the papacy. Um, but in my presentation I was saying that the, the um, authority within Islam um, was in these law schools, which were quite prestigious, um, but with the end of the Ottoman Empire they sort of lost their funding and prestige. So the situation you've got now is that, well, kind of in a sense anyone can stand up and anyone charismatic can stand up and say, well, I speak for the true Islam. So uh, I think um, what you're suggesting, Aaron, is really interesting but quite difficult to achieve. I love the idea. I've always <laughs> loved the idea of a benign dictator. Right? Benign dictators are great because you can cut the red tape. Just, just do it. Don't bother get having a vote for it. It's great. You're amazing. However, they don't exist. But, um, <coughs> but yeah, I generally agree that would be, that'd be a nice thing because I, I think there are aspects of uh, of the Islamic problem, if you like, that come out of the fact that there are no structures and it's a loose, it's like herding cats, you know, it's like trying to get humanists into so, yeah. agree. Yeah. yeah, even we have a leader, Andrew Copson. Okay. Um, I certainly don't underestimate the uh, problem we have with militant Islam, but I would say that Jonathan's done Islamic scholarship a great disservice tonight with his. Uh, presentation of abrogation. I mean, that, that was almost ludicrous. Just that you take a verse and if you find anything that seems to slightly contradict it, you just take the later one. That's not the way it happens. Uh, then, I mean, I, I've got a 25-page document here, which is on the science of interpretation of the Quran, and that's just a summary of all the different ways they interpret their texts. And they take the general principle to start with, and then they see why the later text is, might be different, whether it's a clarification. And I mean, there's been huge debates in Islam on the number of abrogated texts. And the numbers just go from an extreme of something like seven to up to 245 at the limits. I mean, it's, it's nowhere near this simplistic. I, absolutely. I, so I it's, it is really so. a cherry picking exercise because you can make it mean what you want by how you interpret it through this tafsir science. Well, absolutely. I mean, we're all indivi everyone's an indiv individual, so at some point we're all interpreting everything. So there is always an interpretive layer to everything because we're all subjective experiences. 
Um, but yes, I very much simplified application because going through a 25 page thing in half an hour is, is not, is not going to cut it. But it is, it is important to mention that the Quran is not chronologically ordered. I don't know if everyone realises. So the Bible is pretty much chronological and it has a lot of narrative. The Quran doesn't have a lot of narrative and it picks at bits of the Old Testament. But in fact, interestingly, it picks at uh, ha ha Haggadic sort of Midrash and uh, the Tal Talmud, these kind of commentaries. So it doesn't pick things from the Bible, it actually picks things from the Jewish commentaries, which if you really get into it, under, it kind of pulls the rug out from, from the Quran itself again. So there, there are definitely critical analyses we can do which will, which will pull apart the Quran. But, um, but application uh, is, is, is interesting because the Medinan parts of the Quran and the Meccan parts are not like here's Mecca which came first and then here's Medina. They're just interwoven and, and indeed to find out which ones are which you have to do you have to have the hadith to do that. And so it isn't as simple as as clearly as I painted it because actually to understand the Quran you do need really to understand hadith as well. And also there are parts of the Quran which some people readily admit just don't make much sense. The Quran and admits that. It actually says some of it won't be yeah, able to be understood because only Allah understands it. Yeah, and also the grammar that was used, sometimes it's called classical Arabic, it isn't even classical Arabic. It's, uh, there's, there's just problems with... So there are interpreted... There is wriggle room, for sure, and there, there is lots to be... I mean, there is huge amounts of, of scholarly... Uh, Islamic scholastic work going on. However, there's not a high, there's not a great amount of higher criticism. So, it, if you look at the Bible, what happened in the 19th century is the German scholars uh, had this movement called higher criticism, and they took the Bible to task, right? And and that came from within Christianity itself. That's simply not happening with the Quran, and and that is the challenge. That that, that, that you, you will not get to a reformed Quran or a reformed Islam until you can have a fair and open critical analysis of the Quran from Islamic scholars themselves. But uh, Ibn Warwick was saying just recently actually that he, he knew, well, actually a few years ago, he was saying that he knew, he was asked what, what are the great um, liberal Islamic scholars that he knows. He said, oh there's some great ones and they seem to be coming out of Kuwait at the moment. He, he, said, he named a couple, he said, unfortunately the last one has gone into hiding and he wants political asylum. I don't know why, I've lost contact with and, you know, and that's just the sad state of affairs. It's that the critical scholars that are out there are either working under pseudonyms or they're just not getting the chance to, for their work to flourish. It was a massive challenge. Yeah. But yeah, sorry to have simplified that. Yeah, I mean, the, the other point is that there have been huge debates and even wars over how the Quran is interpreted. Um, you know, it's, it's not just a case of it's, it's a very simple thing. I mean, even there's, there's four main schools of Sunni Islam plus several of the, uh, the Shia. I'm not, I'm they've all got I'm different not, interpretations, yeah. there is no simplistic one. <laughs> I'm not denying that, there's just less interpretative uh, overlay than Christianity in the Bible. In comparative terms, the wriggle room is less. And, and that's seen just by the, the, there are less, although the camps are bigger, but then political camps actually. So Sunni and Shia is more to do with the caliphate that came afterwards than to do with the interpretation of the Quran itself. The point remains that those t those verses in there, which are pretty horrible verses, are in there no matter what your interpretation. They are denigrating non-believers. They are denigrating you and I. And and there's no interpretation that gets around that. It is there. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to take all Muslims and just make them uh, humanists, but that isn't going to happen. So we've got to find a moderate Islam first. Yes. Um, I, mean, I, I don't want to hold the mic all evening, so I'll make one other point, and I presume you're aware of the open letter to al-Baghdadi. No, I'm not actually. Well, it, it's, it's quite easily uh, available on the internet. A whole load of Muslim leaders have sent a, an open letter to al-Baghdadi, and it was in the papers as well. Al-Baghdadi is the leader of uh, ISIS, for anyone that doesn't know who I'm talking about. and. Um, it's, it's a hugely long letter, but the, the first part of it is 40 points of why our Baghdadi has absolutely no, no clout to actually interpret the Quran whatsoever. They totally denounced him on 40 points for why he is not allowed to interpret the Quran. 
I mean, the first being simply that you, you have to know classical Arabic. That's, you know, pre the diacritical marks and all the rest of it. And Well, straight away, there's your problem as a re- revelation yeah. from God. If God, God comes out. So the yeah. idea is that Arabic is God's language, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it makes no sense. sense. You know, it, I mean, from a humanistic point of view, you just unpick it so easily, right? Yeah. You know, as a revelation, uh, I'm going to give a, a perfect revelation to the whole world that most people can't understand, even the Muslims generally don't speak Arabic. So, and certainly that form of Arabic, you know, as a revelation, it's pretty terrible. Yeah, I mean, you, you don't reveal stuff in Syriac. You'd have taken Latin or Greek if you were going to be a sensible god and reveal in a language that was easily understood, written down. Or just put ideas in people's heads, yeah. you know? Anyway, I'll, I'll show that. <laughs> Simon, just a brief point to... Uh, <laughs> I was trying to learn something. I, I mean, I was, when I studied the Quran over six or seven years, I was trying really, really to study something, and I couldn't. I'm Jewish. I went to study Christianity, and I was fascinated by Jesus' philosophy. Uh, for example, turn the other cheek. That is something that I implement every day of my life. I learned many things in, when I read the New Testament. And I was totally objective. I was a student. I wanted to learn. I really, really didn't and couldn't understand anything from the Quran. I'm sorry. I'm telling you the truth. Not even one thing. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, Ken. And then, uh, unless anyone is dying to say anything else, oh, John. Yeah. And then we'll uh, try and wrap things up. Ken. The Muslims have two problems. One is in the Quran, uh, it keeps on saying any unbelievers must be killed. Uh, and the second thing is that in this modern world, the Mus- Muslims are underrepresented. If I think they got no veto on the, uh, the five nations have uh, vetoes in the United Nations, and there's 15 members on the uh, Security Council. And uh, maybe, uh, well, I'm not sure whether it's Qatar, is, it, it rotates, but I think there's one small Muslim country that's uh, represented there. But generally speaking, I would have thought that the Muslims are underrepresented, underrepresented in the uh, United Nations. And if you're not represented, uh, you can't make your point, you, you resort to violence. That's a really interesting point. Okay, John. Thank, thank you, Ken. Um, just quickly, I mean, when I work in in schools, that there, there, um, some kids were always taken out of the building at lunchtime by their parents because their sect believed that they shouldn't break bread with heathens, so they're all taken away. Now that's a form of fundamentalism, which is probably socially damaging to the kids, and you just think that's a bit odd. But the Islamic problem is one is one of many fundamentalisms. And I, I think we need to contextualise the problem with the question, what is it that in, to our, ex- to our experience, a very modern world makes these peculiar fundamentalisms persist? And I think it's a universal question. It's about fundamentalist Christians in the southern United States, it, all sorts of extreme views. What causes those to persist? The other observation I'd like to make is that um, Islam as a faith, as it's manipulated by people in power, is peculiarly, as it was in its beginning, as you suggested, it was peculiarly benign towards extreme authoritarianism. And there are lots of non-democratic states which happen to have Islamic governments, and they kind of there's a symbiosis, and there's a, there's a real sort of supportiveness of the two notions that um, the religion and the form of the state and the government of the state support each other. They're anti-democratic, authoritarian things. And those two questions, I think, we need to think about in relation to the uh, topics you've been discussing this evening. That sounds as though you've given us an agenda for at least two more evenings on this, John. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much, Jonathan. I don't want to... Yeah, I do, actually. Two really interesting points. So the second one is about theocracy and whether Islam lends itself to theocracy and that is a governmental mechanism is pretty dangerous right because and it's actually linked to the first point which is actually about morality and really all we're talking about is morality 
Because morality is should. Any should question, any ought, right? Should we do this? Should Muslims be like this? Should they be morally progressive? So when it comes down to what is fundamental, I wrote a piece on this actually, what is fundamentalism? You know, what is extremism? And it, and it really just looks like stuff that's vehemently opposed to our moral paradigm. And that's what's going on here. So really when we, when we say fracture, but really in its simplest terms, this whole issue and the governmental issue is about morality. And, and that's why I said we've got to fight very hard for what we feel is morally right. But that means, because at the, at the end of the day, there are some Quranic claims which are actually morally abhorrent. Like, it's not just like, oh, there's another religion saying silly things. You know, it's pragmatically, and on a day-to-day basis, in reality, it's pretty horrible. Some of the things that, that are condoned or, or advised in that, in, in that book. And so this becomes a moral battle, um, and we've got to do some moral philosophy. Okay, I think we're going to wrap things up there. And will you please give a massive round of applause to Jonathan? <laughs> for coming this evening. Um, for a long time I thought, you know, we really need to try and grasp this nettle. I'm really pleased that we've done it this evening and I'm really pleased that Jonathan kind of instigated that or, or stimulated us to do that. Um, I think it's an incredibly important subject. You know, we should have, you know, a, a hundred people here this evening. I hope that you feel more informed about Islam as a result of coming tonight and I hope that you'll continue to learn about it. Really important that we do. Just